Now keep in mind, when you give a diuretic, since you're getting rid of all this chloride, the kidney's always got to remain fair and balanced. It's got to remain balanced, charge-wise. If not, when you peed, you'd be making electricity. So think about it. So you have to have, if you're losing chloride, the only other ion that you have to make up for that is your, is basically your bicarbonate. Therefore, you reabsorb bicarbonate, and that's why when you take a diuretic, that you become alkalemic in your blood. So you reabsorb the bicarb because you're losing all your chloride because you're blocking the mechanism to reaccumulate your chloride. Now the kidney is going to try like heck to reabsorb the chloride that it can, but when you've blocked it and there's none left to reabsorb, then it's going to start reabsorbing bicarb because it's got to maintain. The first thing kidney always maintains is volume. I mean, yes, volume. So sodium and water. Second thing it maintains is charge, and then the third thing is individual ions. So if your individual ion's low, it'll preferably take a chloride instead of a, a, instead of a bicarbonate, but if there's no chloride there and it's got a balanced charge, it's going to take a, a, a bicarbonate, and thus, when you give a diuretic, you end up making the patient alkalotic. Now, so we've gone through this portion of the kidney, then we come to the aquaporin-2 channels over here. And with the aquaporin channels, what ends up happening is they're under the influence of ADH. And ADH causes the aquaporin channels to migrate to the cell, to the lumen side of the cell, and allows water to come in. Now, why would you want to reabsorb water? Well, it's very simple. There's only two reasons to reabsorb water. One is your volume depleted. So if your volume down, you're, you're going to try to reestablish intervascular volume. I said the, only, the kidney preserves volume first charge second and an individual ion third. So first thing is ADH is going to be turned on if your volume depleted. The second thing it's turned on is if your serum osmolality is high. So for instance, this is something that med students always remember, so I always use this example. When you go into a bar, they place peanuts on the bar. The reason that they do that is because what happens is you take salt in, your sodium rises in your serum, so what you end up doing is you drink more. Drinking more drives your sodium, so it's in balance, what it should be physiologically. Your ADH normally would turn on to reabsorb water in this case. However, since you were taking alcohol, it shuts your ADH off. That's why when you look at your urine, it's clear. So they are double dipping you. They're driving your serum osmolality up, which in turn should be turning on your ADH to help you reabsorb water, maintain your serum balance in your, in your blood. However, what's happening is the alcohol is turning that off. So there's only two things that turn on ADH. Either your volume down or your serum osmolality is high. For instance, if your glucose were 600 in your serum, your ADH is going to be turned on because your serum osmolality is high. However, if neither of these two things are present physiologically, then you have something known as SIADH, which is in a syndrome of inappropriate uh, ADH secretion. So in that case, there's another reason, and if you look in your book, there's going to be about 300 different reasons why that occurs, but the bottom line is if those two physiological factors aren't there, then your ADH shouldn't be turned on. And what that helps you do is reabsorb water back into the bloodstream, establishes intervascular volume. Now you guys are often taught that sodium follows water. It does, most of the time, if you're volume depleted, but they're reabsorbed by different mechanisms. Sodium is the main abundant extra extracellular ion. So it is the main thing that keeps your serum level. Uh, it keeps your fluid into your serum, that in albumin. Thus, if you are volume down, your renin state is going to go up, your angiotensin state is going to go up, and you're going to reabsorb more sodium. In the same token, if your volume depleted, your ADH level is going to go up, so you do reabsorb salt and water in that, in that uh, scenario together in a volume depleted scenario. However, if your serum osmolality is very high, so you're very dehydrated, uh, you will also reabsorb it. However, what I meant to say was if your ADH is excreted without your renin level being turned on, then there might be another cause. It might be because your serum level is, your serum osmolality is very high, such as 
in this case of diabetes or if you're in renal failure and you're not getting rid of your ure urea your your serum level of urea is going to, or your blood urea nitrogen is going to build up that's also going to cause you to reabsorb more water because your ADH is turned on just things to think about and then we come to the last two, the last portion of the kidney, and uh, what we look at there are two cells. We look at one to two cells, and those two cells are the principal cell, and the I, I call it the IC cell. It's the intercalculated cell. I can't ever pronounce that. So on the lumen side of the principal cell is a sodium channel. It's called the ENAC channel, epithelial sodium channel. Sodium is reabsorbed at this stage, and potassium is dumped into the, to the urine in exchange for that. That is under the influence of aldosterone. Now, aldosterone, like everything else, if you're volume depleted, aldosterone is going to be turned on because you're going to reabsorb your sodium in order to reestablish intervascular volume, and you're going to exchange that for a K. However, the other thing is, is if you change your potassium fast, such as we do in Texas when we give lethal injection, when you give a, that, you're giving a rush of potassium, which in turn causes a change in your potassium, which in turn tells the kidney and, the, well, actually, aldosterone comes from the zona, glomerulo, zona glomerulosum in the adrenal gland, it's going to kick out and say, whoa, 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 we need to hold, we can't hold on to that much potassium because what's going to happen is I'm going to die of an arrhythmia. So what happens in that case, a change in the potassium actually can spur aldosterone to be released as well. However, a majority of the time aldosterone is released when you're in a volume depleted state. Okay? It reabsorbs the sodium. If you were volume depleted for too long a period of time, eventually what's going to happen is that potassium is going to be, need to be reabsorbed for a, uh, for a, that potassium is going to fall low and your body knows that you can go into arrhythmia if, you're, if, if you actually get too low of a potassium. So there's another ATPase pump on the luminal side which exchanges the potassium for a hydrogen ion. That hydrogen ion then forms, gets trapped by pneumonia to make pneumonium in the tubule, I mean, in the, yeah, inside the lumen of the tubule and gets peed out. That is where you get acidification of your urine. The potassium is going to come back in, you're going to maintain potassium homeostasis, and you're going to get rid of the acid. The other thing is if you take too much acid, acid in your diet, which we mostly do if you eat burgers and stuff like I do, what ends up happening is your potassium becomes, I mean, your, sorry, your, your acid builds up, your bicarbonate's going to buffer it to a degree, you'll reabsorb most of your bicarbonate, but if you don't reabsorb your bicarbonate, uh, then you would get a renal tubular acidosis. If you do appropriately handle it, like we mainly all do, then what ends up happening is you excrete the acid, the acid therefore uh, gets excreted and you maintain your balance in your blood and you exchange a potassium for that acid ion. When you, re when you get rid of that acid though, you actually reabsorb another bicarbonate and that is how the last 10% of your bicarbonate gets reabsorbed. So if you're taking a diuretic for too long, so you're taking a diuretic too long, uh, what ends up happening is your chloride gets dumped like we talked about with the Lasix channel. Eventually, because you're blocking your potassium, it's going to get dumped in your urine too. Eventually, the kidney's going to say, uh-oh, I need to hold on to some of my potassium because if not, I'm going to get an arrhythmia. It switches it for an H ion, in which case you dump the H ion, but you reabsorb a bicarbonate. That's how you become alkalotic when you're taking a diuretic or if you had Barter's or Gettleman syndrome. Now, if this ENAC channel was turned on completely all the time, that's something known as Little syndrome, L-I-D-D-L-E-S. And it is, in that case, the patient becomes very, they, they actually become very hypertensive and their sodium is being reabsorbed the whole time. Eventually, what ends up happening is you end up, uh, uh, 
need something to block that mechanism, and we give amelioride or triamterene, which actually works at this ENAC channel. So those are diuretics that work at the ENAC channel. They block the reabsorption of sodium. Uh, they make you retain some K, or you can use spironolactone, which blocks aldosterone, which means that aldosterone doesn't get to the ENAC channel and allow you to reabsorb sodium. The fractional excretion of sodium in that case is very low. It's about less than 2%. And therefore, what you end up seeing is a, is a potassium, I mean, is a, a very, very low yield as far as a diuretic's concerned of getting rid of water and salt because the rest of the tubule has time to reabsorb that before it gets to the distal tubule. So with the distal tubule, the diuretic, though, that you'll often see is if you com combine the thiazide plus spironolactone or triamterene or amelioride, what you end up seeing is about a 7%, uh, you know, basically 7% fractional excretion of sodium, so you get rid of some salt and water that way. Okay, now to rehash uh, hormonal uh, influence, angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction. It comes from the renin state. Renin state is revved up and aldosterone state is revved up if your volume depleted or you're not getting perfused to your kidney. Renin released from the macula densa basically means no urine flow by the macula densa in the, in the tubule which is usually due to volume depletion or narrowing of a renal artery or scarring of that kidney. Something that's going to cause your renin state to go up. Aldosterone is released because your volume depleted and it reabsorbs sodium in the distal tubule. It also responds to a change in K. So if there's a high rate of K uh, uh, into the, it flux into the, to the serum, in order to prevent arrhythmias, aldosterone is going to be released to help you get rid of that. ADH is, re, is a, a re, physiological response to two things. Either your volume depleted, you need to reabsorb more water through the aquaporin channels, or two, your serum osmolality is uh, such that you've got to reestablish your uh, appropriate electrolyte balance in your serum by reabsorbing water. Anything else, it would be inappropriate. The three areas where, or actual four diuretic areas, and we'll talk about the last one here in a second, is proximal tubule, you use acetazolamide. The loop diuretic works at the loop of Henle. The thiazide diuretic works in the distal tubule, or collecting duct, and then uh, these two, uh, the aldosterone, which is spironolactone, uh, works by uh, stopping the ENAC channel. Triamterene and uh, and uh, ameliorite blocks the actual uh, ENAC channel itself. There is one diuretic that works at the level of the glomerulus, which is an osmotic diuretic, which would be the same as giving too much glucose, and that's called mannitol. Mannitol is freely filtered here at the glomerulus and then is not reabsorbed anyplace else. So, like I told you before, if 700 milliosmoles presents to the distal tubule, you will pre pee out one liter of fluid. So, in other words, it is an osmotic diuretic that drives the force of your uh, urine output in that case. The proletarian of the kidney is the proximal tubule. The most bang for your buck using a diuretic is at the loop of Henle. If you want to utilize a milder diuretic, you'd use a thiazide, but still getting an effect. And if you want to hold on to potassium and not lose your potassium as much, you'd use either spironolactone or amelioride. Last thing is, exclusive things reabsorbed in the proximal tubule are a phosphate, glucose, amino acids. Remember the coal uh, uh, mnemonic that I taught you all? Uh, uh, uric acid as well, as well as uh, citrate and 90, 85 to 90% of your bicarbonate. If you have a problem in your proximal tubule with the reabsorption of all those various uh, electrolytes and molecules, that is known as a Fanconi syndrome. The loop diuretic that's turned on all the time is called Barter's. The one that uh, actually has the thiazide turned off, or as if it were, you were giving thiazide all the time, that's known as Gettles, Gettleman's. And then Lydell syndrome is when the patient becomes hypertensive because it's like they have their ENAC channel turned on the whole time. 
Well, I hope you guys got something out of this. Uh, you can always email me, and it's been my pleasure. I hope you guys get something, and good luck on your tests. Bye.